My guest is Carla Harris. She is the vice chairman of Morgan Stanley's Wealth Management. She joined the bank in 1987. She rose through the ranks. She is one of the most powerful people on Wall Street. Two years ago, she started investing in the next crop of billion-dollar ideas. So she and her team, they're looking for the next Facebook, the next Google, the next Netflix. And she's looking in a place where most of Silicon Valley is not. She's backing female and multicultural entrepreneurs. We started our conversation about her first few steps on Wall Street. I was drawn to Morgan Stanley, frankly, after my sophomore year in college. I was in a program called the Spons Sponsors for Educational Opportunity. And the program was created to expose talented kids of color to Wall Street and Wall Street to talented kids of color in hopes that they would build a pipeline into the analyst, the newly created analyst programs. Every person that I met was a little different than the last person that I met. And that said to me, there's a lot of different equations that equal success in this environment. Surely there might be one for me. So if you had to describe your job to, say, a seven-year-old, to really break it down into Lego parts, what would you say? I'd say uh, my job is to try to present the company, Morgan Stanley, in the best way to get more individual and institutional clients to do business with Morgan Stanley. So that might mean that I'm giving a keynote address in front of a thousand people. That might mean I'm sitting down with someone who owns a business that wants to figure out a way to help it grow, either through the public markets or even through a private sale. Or that might mean actually spending time with, with our, our employees internally, training them on relationship building or uh, how to use technology more effectively. So anything that's going to create more customers for Morgan Stanley, that's what I do. I am imagining that you were the only woman in the room in numerous instances, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps the only African-American in the room in numerous instances. Mm -hmm. What is the advice that you would pass along to people who still, even 30 years later, may find themselves in your shoes. Remember your that shoes. whenever you are the only person in the room that looks like you, you have an advantage. Because everybody... Some people feel insecure and feel like it's a disadvantage. That's right. Yeah. And that's why I'm saying my advice is to remember that when you're the only one in the room, you have an advantage. Because everyone else looks like each other and they're vying for the attention. You're the one that looks different. Everybody's going to look at you. And everybody's going to be listening. And all you have to do is to deliver your excellence right into that opening. What do you see that has changed, either from staffing or otherwise, in financial, let's say the number one change mm -hmm. in the past three decades in financial services? Despite the fact, Deidre, that we still don't have enough women and enough people of color in positions of leadership and authority, there are more than there were in 1987. In 1987, I could name every senior woman at every firm on the street. And mind you, there were more firms that existed back then. Right. I could name every person of color that was in a senior position. I can't do that today, which means there are Good. more, right? And so, but I still think we have a long way to go. But that's the number one thing that I'll tell you that has changed. You have had a lot of responsibility now for a very long time. What would you say to, and these are sometimes cold from questions that I get in response to this show, mm -hmm. for a woman, let's say, who's in her 40s, who's just about to break out to a very senior level, can't quite, let's say she's navigated so well for so long, just can't quite get to that next mm -hmm. step. What would you say? I would say check your relationship currency because there's two types of currency in any environment, performance currency and relationship currency. And if you've gotten right there to what you perceive as the ceiling, then your perform performance currency is probably intact. If you're having trouble breaking through, that means you probably haven't made the right relationships around that opportunity that can then push you right through. Because when you get to that stage, it's not about the performance. It's all about who's in the room when the decision is being made and who knows you well enough to spend some of their currency on your behalf. That's what it'll take. So if you can't push through, step back and say, who's in that room and who do I have relationships with? And more importantly, who don't I have relationships with? I now need to take some of that hardworking energy and redirect it into investing in these relationships. And that will make the difference. What if somebody's afraid that he or she will be punished for breaking rank? Well, that's the importance of building these relationships the, the entire way throughout your career because then it won't look like you're breaking rank. And then if you haven't done that and now you want to start doing that and somebody says, why are you talking to Jim? Say, I thought we we're supposed to have relationships across the board. Is there a problem? 
with me talking to Jim? And the person's never going to tell you not to do that. And if they do, then now you know that person is insecure. And now you know that you have to be more careful. But that's all the more reason that you should be building relationships around that person. Best advice you have ever been given. Yes. Best professional advice that I've ever been given, actually, is uh, happened when I was a third year associate. Another senior woman said to me, uh, Carla, you know, your problem is you're so quick to say you don't know and you just can't say I don't know in this business because people pay us millions of dollars for our judgment um, and she said why don't you just do it like the boys do frequently wrong but never in doubt and I got to tell you Deidre that didn't sit right with me because I couldn't imagine myself just saying something saying wrong something, yes. but it made me realize that what she was really talking about is when you answer answer with confidence so I learned to embrace that advice and make it work in an authentic way for me and here's what I did if someone asked me something that I didn't know I would at least try to give an answer mm -hmm. I would say here's what I think the answer is but let me check that so I gave myself room to go get the real answer if I was wrong and then come back and present it but do that in a way that was confident and that did make a difference.